after this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've never seen those say before. One. So what are the three, you said there's three boobies on Palmyra. There's the mast, the red-footed, and brown. And then brown. Yep. Gotcha. The mast are the largest, and then the brown and then the red-footed. And the uh -oh. mast boobies and the brown boobies nest on the ground. <laughs> and, and the red-footed boobies nest in the trees. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Have you ever gotten to see any little baby boobies? Oh, yeah. I've got tons of pictures if you ever want to see them. They're I really cute. do. Like, I never really cared that much for, or I still, hmm. I have a hard time liking birds. Um, but then Corley was showing me those videos of them, like, looking at their reflections <laughs> last year, and I was like, these are the cutest things ever. They are super goofy. And, um, and they, uh, they do a, there's a project that's, that looks at the baby birds. Uh-huh. Um, so they go out and monitor all the nesting, the status of the nesting birds. So there's the the eggs, the babies, and the juveniles, trying to see how many of there are and what stage they're in in development. Oh, so neat. But tons of really cute pictures from those. I definitely want to see those. Um, so I get to work sometimes with a bird ornithologist expert from um, Corpus Christi, Dr. Congratulations on becoming a doctor, uh, but Dr. David Newstead. And I love it because sometimes he makes, a, when they're weighing out these little birds, like a Gosh, now I'm blanking out. Piping plovers, the plovers. Uh -huh. They put them in like a little burrito thing, so they look like little birdie burritos <laughs> with like their little heads sticking out. And nice. then they're able to get like an accurate weight and measurement on them. Uh, so cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've gotten a much greater appreciation for birds in my time out on Palmyra. <laughs> I know, uh, I don't know about Lynette before she made it out to Palmyra, but I know she was out trying to bird watch the other day. Yeah, she, she really uh, made a lot of bird friends out there. You know. <laughs> Especially the petrels and the ones that swim aboard or come to come to the boat. They're the, most of the, the boobies out on Pomayo were her. That was what she was following mostly. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then we had the petrel come on board the ship a couple oh, of nights yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, the little petrol that came yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She took care of that one. Those things, yeah, we were looking up um, what they looked like last night from four to eight. So cool. Yeah. Any other really interesting critters out there besides uh, all the birds, the boobies? Yeah, the there's... Dolphin a, skeleton? Yeah. <laughs> there's a, it's a really unique ecosystem. There's no no mammals or anything like that on the islands. So it's uh -huh. all the only vertebrates other than us, and we're only visitors. But the only permanent vis uh, vertebrates out there are uh, geckos. And so other than that, there's crabs. Um, and yeah, lots of really cool crabs, like coconut crabs and hermit crabs. Um, some insects, really beautiful trees. Uh, some large, uh, really nice rainforest. That's one of the projects that we're working on is, um, there was a coconut plantation that somebody had tried to grow coconut palms there a couple mm -hmm. of times. And so the coconut palms have kind of taken over. And we're trying to reduce the numbers of those coconut palms so that the natural forest can grow back. How do you do that? Just going out there with a chainsaw and a machete? Um, that's part of it, yeah. That's <laughs> a big part of it. Um, but you um, try and take out the larger palms first so that they stop sprouting and then hack the sprouts as they keep coming up. Mm. Um, it's been, a long, yeah. ongoing project. Yes, yeah. So we removed all the invasive Brazilian pepper plants from uh, one of our wildlife managements. I'm a board of director for it. And now we're trying to spread the love to uh, our school owns 60 acres of wetlands and remove those invasive species. And so that is, yeah, because it's anytime you get any kind of cross contamination, you're just like, oh, I'm out here again. So every month we go out there, either hack up the big enough ones or we use some chemical spray like um, like Roundup to spray yeah. them off. Yeah, that gets used out there too. Yeah, yeah. Which, um, I know there's been some controversy about Roundup, and it's definitely interesting. Uh, but then the next leading contender is double the price. Right. And also, it's kind of hard to find something that will be as effective. Yes. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Besides just pure manpower going out. Yeah. Uh -oh. And So Crab City over there. 
Yep. Do y'all throw like your, your food waste over there and just like, here you go, little guys? Yeah, so we have a place called Crab Town. Crab Town, there we go. It's a lot of fun to go visit, um, but all of our food waste goes to Crab Town. And <laughs> they all come out of the forest and they they get fed pretty well. They eat a lot of our food, <laughs> a lot of food. We try to have as minimal waste as possible, mm -hmm, but the scraps, the scraps go to them. How often do y'all guys get like a supply ship or a supply plane? Uh, it depends on the season, but I would say on average, we get a flight comes down every two weeks on average, and we get resupplied with each one of those flights. During the quieter seasons, like the winter, mm -hmm. we'll have maybe one flight throughout the season, so that'll be about every six weeks is about the longest you go without a flight. Gotcha. And how many people are down there during the winter season? Um, that depends on if they have a coconut uh, fish and wildlife volunteer team down there. But this last winter, there was eight, no, nine people. There was two fish and wildlife and seven TNC people. So a total of 16 people for three months? No, that was, uh, that was just, we had 11 for three months, or for half of the three months. So you were probably forming some incredibly tight-knit lifelong relationships when there's only 11 people for three months yeah you get to know those people really really well <laughs> and there's not it's the island that we all live on is about three miles long by one mile mi one mile wide roughly and it seems like a pretty good size but it gets real small real quick so. So does everybody have like their unique little hiding hole, their little place to go away and find their inner peace? Yeah, people kind of disperse around the island on their days off. I have uh -huh. my own secret place where I put up my hammock and no one can find me. I have to keep my radio on, but but yeah, we try to find little spots, little nooks and crannies where no one else is around. And you ride your bicycle all around, right? Yeah, so we all get bicycles and you can ride them mostly around the station and up and down the runway. So cool. I thought I heard somebody. Oh, I did. I love how you.
Adam, did you see that? <laughs> yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> Sintai. So bad. <laughs> yeah, Sintai. <laughs> Not at all. Good morning to everybody tuning in from our side of the world. Yes, we are recovering the vehicles in about an hour. Hour and three minutes. Yes, the whale fossils. Test, test. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Sounds like a good question for science. Hello, H12. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, Dan. Aware. Thank you. How successful are you with breaking the rocks off as a general rule? It depends on the rock. Some, uh, you know, some are easy to break in big chunks. Some is uh, like cement. No, that's you not very scientific, I know. But have you had success with breaking off basalts, Corley, previously? Weathered basalts, but not, um, not fresh basalts, which is what we're looking for. Yeah, so I have a hard time seeing us going to be able to break something off here. Yeah, me too. All right, well, then let's continue on. 
Look at that. Keep on. What about this one from the still cam? It looks like it might be it does. kind of could be. It also movable. looks huge. <laughs> oh yeah, is it too big? <laughs> Don't you know the geologists pay by the ton? <laughs> Are we still moving or are we stopped? We are not moving. Right. We've been still for a while. <laughs> oh man. That's I think so. Never mind. All right. At least we tried. What if you try driving the vehicle into it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually doing that on the one in front of us. But like as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> wow, when that really wants a rock. <laughs> I do that all the time. You just don't see it. <laughs> you see the camera go bonk. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep an eye out for a likely victim, but and a bonus look at a from Noah. Yeah. That's all. I, I'm good. Right right go ahead and get the ship underway. Uh, yeah, I can get us moving. South. Sure. Seems to be the flavor of the day. Bridge nav. Can we have five zero meters cool. south, please? Thank you. Daryl, we have another audio or video question for you, which is. How do you adjust the color of the mainstream so it doesn't look oppressively blue? We color balance, so white balance and black balancing. Come up a bit there. Uh, the idea of white balancing is so that you don't have, it's so you can get the correct lighting or correct colors with the lights. So instead of getting that strong blue tint, which it is, have a little bit here, um, it's because we're what balancing the cameras. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Do you do gamma correction as well, Daryl? Currently, I'm, uh, no, I'm mostly writing on Iris. Okay. If I was at home and working at like a stadium, yes, but I'm not. Another one of the pro-isocrinus, uh, or pro-isocrinus um, uh, sea lilies or, or stalked crinoids here. A couple more of these uh, benthic tunicates or we've been seeing. to my phone since it's not working. Looks like we got another one of those primnoid whips we've been seeing and uh, some type of probably euplectalid um, sponge. A couple of them. And a uh, little, little chrysogorgia. What is the purple down there? Mm. Is that a baby Victorgia? Push in there a bit, Daryl. Still cam. Oh, yeah. Baby Victorgia. 
It's the first one on this feature. Certainly on, at least on our watch. Okay. Yep, thank you. And that looks like a little small anthemastus back there as well. Bring our head just a bit to the right for me. Let's look at that. That's our first um, paramercia. Okay. Push in there, Daryl. No associates. All right, perfect. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. As a scuba diver, I love just scuba diving around little rocks and crevices and looking in them and seeing what little critters lie there. I'm just kind of thinking if we could, definitely not on an ROV, but if you could just go and Look in all those little crevices, what all critters you would find. You want to keep it moving south, Dan? Uh, you want some time? Yeah, just poke around here for a okay. minute. Let's see. Beautiful, the Gorgia. These corals always look so seussical to me. Yeah, I totally agree. I often think of them as Dr. Seuss corals. There is a coral back here. If it's in range, I'd like to look at that, please. Sure. Good eye, I missed it. Oh, pretty bright yellow. Come down, five. So I think this is new for the expedition. I believe this is a um, Cratocidae <coughs> ne, which is a type of bamboo coral. It's beautiful, that bright yellow. Yellow is my favorite color, so I, I'm definitely enjoying this color. And it's got one uh, camatuloid crinoid. 
no brittle stars, which is unusual. And it's also got no dead tissue, which is kind of unusual for a bamboo coral in this expedition, too. It always seems weird to me when you get, like, a rare coral like this one, or at least rare for this area. Um, and you've got such a single, big, beautiful specimen of it, but just one out by itself always surprises me. Zoom in there, Daryl. Got a polyp zoom while we're here. Go all the way tight. So, like, there's a crinoid on it. Oh, there's yeah. A crinoid one, the lampopod. Yeah. Wow. I can hold the ROV still so you can see the polyps. Those are gorgeous. There's that there's little amphipod. Else, but is this just an isopod? Yeah, amphipod, I think. And you can see the nodes there peeking through the yellow skeleton. Um, this is new and rare. Uh, are you in a position to take a snip? Uh, yeah, we, we'll have to move the boat there. Yeah, I think that's probably worth it. Okay, go wide. I can't I don't quite get a polyp zoom there. We're getting some tether bounce. You want to just do like two zero meters north? Sure. Okay. Bridge, nav. Can we move two zero meters north, please? Thank you. I love it. A viewer online is saying that watching our or tracking our ship's movement makes us look like we're a stalked crinoid or maybe a sea spider. <laughs> I think this is probably an S1 clade. Come down a few meters for me. Don't have a perch here yet. I do, but you keep pulling me off. Friend, stop tugging on his leash. Stop that. It's very annoying. Don't you know it's rude? <laughs> <laughs> ship's moving north, but Atalanta is still moving a little bit south. Yeah. Go the other way, right? <laughs> Swim faster. <laughs> How long is the tether between Atlanta and Herc? 35 meters. Okay. Give or take a meter. Bridge, nav. Can we have another one zero meters north, please? Thank you. You can do a grosser move if you want. Drag it over the top of us the other way. Hopefully this will get you up here. You'll have plenty of room. Normally I would change our heading and come around, but I don't I can't don't have the leash to do that.
for those online, there are 3D files that you can use. Uh, they're under the education section of NautilusLive.org. They're also on a couple of different platforms uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head. But if you go to education, uh, down at the bottom, there is a way that you can look up lessons and you'll be able to find several 3D models that you can print or look at. Beautiful shot. Great, yeah. great angle in the DSC too, looking out into the black. I didn't even notice this little coral right here. Yeah, the little Chrysogorgia right at its base. Yeah. I'm really shocked at the lack of uh, brittle stars. That seems super strange to me. To see no brittle stars in a big coral like this, this far out into the um, flow when the, we were seeing the little primnoids um, just a minute ago that were just loaded with them. Do you think it maybe has some kind of biological or chemical defense? It's totally possible, yeah. Um, You'll have to move her a little more than it. I'm still not getting the leash I need. Yeah, Atalanta just hasn't even started moving north yet. I think if we keep pushing it north, then... It'll <laughs> swing the other way. It'll, it'll swing overrun. the other way. Of course, I had to find the coral at the exact incon most inconvenient place. A great spot. This ship's not in the right yep. spot. Atalanta's just starting to move north. It definitely moves slower than Argus. Why would that be? <laughs> Half the weight. Okay, Daryl, zoom in there to see if it's going to hold still for us. Closer uh, branch for see the polyps. When we bring up a snip of something brightly colored like this from the bottom to the surface, is there a lot of color loss or is the color loss just when you put it in a preservative? Uh, generally, I see it more once it goes in the preservative. Sometimes it, it, it looks a little like it's lost a little bit of color in the temperature change. Would you go ahead and shoot a sample in situ? Um, just um, yeah, I got one. Oh, you got one? Yeah. Just, okay, I'd assume. Do you um, want this one for instance? It doesn't have, no, it doesn't have to be this particular branch. I just wanted to make okay. sure you got a a sample tagged close up. Yeah. Um, yeah, the temperature change affects it a little bit, but it's mainly once we drop in the ethanol that we really see the massive color change. Uh -oh. Zoom out slow for a second. I can find them. Maybe. Some samples really change color on the way up. I remember there was that one sample that completely bled out um, yeah. in the water when we found yeah, it on the vehicle. You can actually see a really big difference uh, between ROVs. Uh, and how well insulated and sealed the bio boxes are. Um, if the bio boxes are super well insulated and sealed, the samples come up in way better shape than if there's a sloshing and mixing with the warm tropical water on the top. Mm. How much of this guy do you want? Ten, ten centimeters or so. Something like that. Um, yeah, that, a little bit more, I'm sorry, yeah, that should be fine. Is 10 centimeters like the unofficial, official measurement for snipping? Um, it just, it, it frankly, once we subsample it, it fits into the different vials real conveniently, because we'll take a couple subsamples for uh, a couple different researchers and leaves us a nice little chunk to send to MCZ. Uh, 
Where are we putting this thing? Uh, do you want to slurp it or do you want to put it in a box? Either is fine with me. So um, slurp jar two is open. I could try for slurp or, jar two. Or all three of the small bio boxes on the starboard are open too. Yeah. Let's put it in a bio box, I think would be my preference. Roger. Sample number data? 152. 152, thank you. Um, I'm gonna have to uh, reposition because I got the laterosis pegged right now and it'll blow it away. Well, would Slurpee better? I mean, I. Uh, no, I'll just now that we got some room here, it should. Okay. So I don't have a strong preference where it goes. Uh, okay. I should be good here. Let's see if I turn off uh, one of my verts in the lats. I should be kind of porpoise a bit there, but can uh, zoom back in there if you want, Daryl. There's one little anemone hiding behind the uh, crinoid as well. And this is the healthiest looking bamboo. I feel like we've seen this entire expedition. Yeah. Sorry, Chris, what box was open? It's, there's the three small ones on the starboard side. Roger. Okay. I could push the box out. Copy. Yeah, the forward, oh. forward small is the only one that's occupied. Roger. Do these samples have an effective shelf life? Like after 10 years, they're done? Nope, once they're in ethanol, they're pretty they're much good forever. forever. I imagine there is an upward limit somewhere, but you know there are definitely samples in the museums from 100 years ago that are still totally valid. And the genetics work. Stop, stop. You know, as long as... Uh, As long as the, uh, as long as you got hard drive storage, the genetic code stuff is unlimited. Okay. Makes sense. Morphology of them changes with an ethanol, though, and that's why you would put it in formal formalin to. No, we generally the default is ethanol um, for everything, both yeah. molecular the stuff we're going to use for molecular analysis and uh, morphological specimens. Oh, okay. Um, if it has really fine tissues and is gelatinous E, we'll put it at uh, some part of it in formula as well. So like we put one of the little, uh, one of the jellyfish, we, the little coralless jellyfish, one of them went in formula and we're gonna put a sample of the Ocidax that last watch captured the bone-eating worms, they'll go in formula. Um, but the corals seem to do just fine in ethanol alone for both morph and genetics. Hmm. But the formalin mucks up the genetics, so and okay. we kind of try and avoid it. And it's way more toxic mm -hmm. and mm. so hard and harder to work with. So anything that can go into ethanol goes into ethanol. Okay. Thank you, front row. Pleasure. Question online, why do we never see large schools of fish, sharks, or whales? A um, couple answers. One, yeah, I was, <laughs> how do you, I was like, how do you want to tackle that one? Um, one is the depth. So there's just, as we get deeper, the fish life gets sparser. Um, there definitely are a lot of different types of fish down here. Um, but the, you know, in environments like this, where all of the, fixed carbon or basically food has to come from photosynthesis that happens in the shallow water and rains down here. The deeper you go, the lower the quality of the food is. Um, so there's just less food availability down here. So active swimmers and things that use more energy like fish become less abundant purely because there's less food down here. Um, but you totally can see 
uh, sharks and rays down this deep. We do encounter them sometimes. Um, and so, but the reason you don't see the schools is just there's lower abundance of fish down here. Um, but as we get shallower, uh, we pick up more and more. So if we were at say 500 meters, um, you do get um, much large, you know, much greater number of fish, a greater diversity of fish. Uh, and then once you start getting shallower in the 500 meters into the like three, two, three, 400 meter range, you do start picking up some school sometimes. Um, Antheus hanging out in groups in that depth range. Uh, and once you get up into 200 meters. Uh, DSC from the other side there. You start picking up, um, you know, surface fish, lots of hammerheads, brown sharks, tuna, um, all those kind of things we'll pick up. I've seen swordfish down in the many hundreds of meters range before, blow past ROVs at high speed. Um, so. They certainly, certainly a lot of fish exist in the deep sea, but down here at 1,800 meters, um, the cusk eels, the halosaurs. The one thing we haven't seen at all yet is a bathosaurus, um, which is a type of deep sea lizard fish. Um, and we haven't seen a single one yet. And then we have been seeing sharks almost every single time we yeah. Exit the water. Uh, yes, and in the surface waters, we there, the population of oceanic white tips is is quite robust around yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> they are with us continuously. Definitely makes you double think, wanting to go for a swim. But yeah, we've seen schools of mahi, schools of tuna, and multiple white tip oceanic white tips. Uh, from the vehicle in shallow water as we're recovering. A couple little baby Ritagorgias, another one of the Crata Isidays we just sampled here. Sea cucumber. We have about 25 minutes left on the bottom. We want to keep an eye out for a rock? Yes, please. Okay. Another primnoid, another paramariciid. Clay might change his mind now that we have coral. <laughs> And we need like a load sling under the vehicle to just attach to a rock I know. and just winch up. Yeah. Or like a giant Robo hammer says one. that just like <laughs> <laughs> smashes. The problem is the hammer just knocks the vehicle off the rock. Or was it Jason or Ropos that recovered the entire hydrothermal vent? What? 20 Ropos. years ago. Ropos, yeah. Ropos, Delaney, and Fisher. Yeah. How? They bolted a, they set up a captures thing to the top of a hydrothermal vent and took a giant chainsaw and Ropos just sliced <laughs> through the hydrothermal vent chimney and they took up like, I don't know, it was huge, like 10 or 15 feet of intact hydrothermal vent. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, one of the, um, the navigators or pilots from the ONC crews last time was on that expedition when they did that. God, now I'm blanking out on their name. Rumor is that piece of hydrothermal vents in the Smithsonian somewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard. That, I actually thought, I thought it was the, uh, or maybe another piece is at the New York Natural History Museum. Well, maybe I've, that's where I've it seen is, it, yeah. um, but I forget which one of the museums I was in. I'm pretty sure it's New York. Google to the rescue.
another little Ritagorgia here. You want a ship move like 210? Sure. Bridge nav. Hmm. Can we have 30 meters 210, please? Thank you. Lime Star. Aw, hi, friend. You can just take a quick zoom on that. Just yeah, for the zoom spot. Go ahead. That's probably good enough, thanks. Okay, go ahead, thanks. And then we do about the same level of zoom on the yellow core on the top right. Right. Go ahead there. All right, that's it. That's all I need. Thanks. So that's okay. another pair of mercy. Go away. Another slime star. Oops. So I'm trying to find some stuff on when they brought the hydrothermal vent up to those museums, and I can't find anything, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's see if Wikipedia has anything. Can we take just a real quick zoom yeah, go up ahead here? There. Nope, yeah. not that one. Oh, sorry. Uh, so go ahead sponge. there. Yeah, it's a Walteria. It looks kind of like a stabby sponge, like an icicle. All right, that's all I need. Thanks. That's a Walteria sponge, and looks like there's a bathopath. Yep, there's a bathopathies as well. Suddenly, the diversity of sea stars here. We see Go ahead there. two slime stars. We just passed a Goni Astrid sea star, and there's another something on a sea star over to the left. Okay. That's another. That's another one of these primnoid whips we've been seeing. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Go away. And if we can get a, a, a quick zoom on that star as well, please. Okay. Oh, 
What kind of starfish or sea star did you say this was? I don't know off the top of my head. I've seen it. Um, it's in. I have to go dig through my guide. All right, that's good for now, though. Oh, beautiful shot of the tube feet on the still cam. You want to try a move two three zero? Yeah, can do. Looks okay. like that's the way. Bridge now. Can we have three zero meters two three zero, please? Thank you. Another bathopathies, another Chrysogorgia. Question online, do we have any plans to use baited traps to attract deep sea creatures? No, we don't have any plans on this expedition. Um, Last generally, year. yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was just saying, generally ROVs aren't an ideal platform for that because um, they're loud and they move. And so um, if you're gonna bait something, it's better to have a stationary camera and let it soak for long enough that, you know, in one spot to attract things in but baited traps are, are a common tool in deep sea science. We got to use um, a couple of them in the last year on the mapping expedition to Papahanaumokuakea. Oh, nice. The only issue is recovering them is, we couldn't recover one of them. Oh. So they came up to the surface and we just kind of had the little radio antenna trying to find it, listen for it to ping and could not find it. It's a good idea to never put something in the ocean you can't afford to lose. That is a very good rule. Fortunately, so much ocean tech is so expensive. <laughs> it's true. I mean, afford to lose is a relative term. Yeah. Because it is often very expensive. Yeah. Can we look at that, please? Sure. I have definitely lost a $10,000 drop camera before. Ooh. Honestly, that's not that bad. That's uh, not that bad. That <laughs> was one of the reasons we were using that system was because it was particularly cheap. I should know that. Was it one of the ones that looks like a gigantic sphere? No, it wasn't one of the Nat Geo drop cams. No, we were doing um, something else. So this is a looks like a black coral, probably an umbellopathies. Um, this is the first one we've seen on this dive. And there's some get more a little tighter. Yep. The circular shapes up top. And it's chock full of the brittle stars. All right, thank you very much. Okay, here we go away. A uh, question online also, is anyone in the U.S. using the Bremen University underwater drill and coring system to drill through rocks? Not that I'm aware of, but that certainly doesn't mean that yeah. somebody isn't. Yeah. The U.S. is pretty big. There's a lot of researchers. Yeah. I know ONC does um, the Wally robot with Bremen University. Is this like a dead sponge, a dead? I believe it's probably a dead Walteria, okay. is my guess. It's a little harder to tell once they're dead. It could be a whole host of different euplectalids. I don't see any of the spikies coming off the side that are diagnostic of the Walterias, but since we just saw a Walteria a minute ago, oh, yep, there they are. And you zoom in on the on the still shot, you can see them. So yeah, that, that thing is, is skeleton loaded. of a Walteria. So many brittle stars. So what is this on our right coming into frick? I guess it's some type of coral. It's huge. 
It's a bamboo. Yep, looks like another big bamboo. Wow. Yeah, that thing is absolutely massive. Yeah, quite tall. A uh, question about the little circle things? Answer is we do not know. Uh, the kiwi urchins? Can we do a little, uh, just kind of a half zoom on a polyp? Sure. Uh, no, like the ones that were like... If it's a nodal brancher or a uh, internodal branching. If it was like a fossil last night. I can't even... I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an internodal brancher. All right, thank you. You want another move that way? Uh. Two, three, zero? Or maybe just west? Mm. Uh, yeah, it looks like west is uphill, okay. according to Atlanta. Bridge nav. Another big, beautiful Aritagorgia. Ooh, Can we that move one has three zero meters west, please? Extra Thank spirals, you. it looks. Seeing this one makes me realize we have not seen a Rodan or Ritagorgia yet this expedition, which is similar to this. For a second there, I thought that's what this was, which is what makes me think about it. But they're really cool. They have super long branches and are very shaggy. They're kind of a Ritagorgia spiral, but shaggier. Ooh. So is this a different species of a Ritagorgia, but not Rodan? Probably. So Rodana Ritagorgia is a, 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 g a different genus, but that shrimp. heterocarpus shrimp. watching them swim. It's so neat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when my class needs a calm down moment, I put on like the jellyfish camera from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Or I feel like a lot of different aquariums now have a jellyfish camera. And just watching the jellyfish's movement is so soothing. They're Perhaps. so hard to keep. Jellyfish? Yeah. Yeah, I looked into buying a jellyfish um, tank because I have several saltwater aquarias and I wanted to get a jellyfish one. They are extremely expensive. Yeah, they're super finicky to keep in captivity. The cryosol tanks you have to get are, you have to get the flow exactly right. The water chemistry has to be exactly right. Ooh. A couple people I went to grad school with did uh, Tina Four and jellyfish work, and they were always struggling to keep their um, tanks ha happy and healthy. Another little very thin um, bodied and branching Chrysogorgia. Chrysogorgia. Push in there, yep. One little squat lobster in a decent sized brittle star. Good morning, all of our students tuning in from Friday Harbor. Uh, is this Megan's right. husband's okay. class? Thank you. Oh, what? And Corley, they have a question for you, which is, is all of this geology that we are witnessing volcanic in origin? Um, partially, yes. Uh, so what makes this sort of feature is I mean, this feature is a uh, geo, which is um, 
an under it starts as an underwater volcano. Um, but then this black stuff that you see on top of it is a different type of rock. It's called ferromanganese crust. It's a hydrogenetic rock, which means it's formed out of the seawater on top of a hard substrate. So in this case, basalt. Uh, that's a type of sedimentary rock. And then you yeah, can see this kind of white sandish yeah. uh, sediment yeah, stuff is also um, sedimentary we... rock as well. Okay, I'll just let this move settle out. Awesome, thank you. We're gonna do something with that bowing on the front porch. All right, everyone, where well, we're just wrapping up our dive here, um, and we're going to start getting ready to recover. We've got a little housekeeping to do on the vehicle, and then they'll swing out into tow formation, and we'll leave the bottom. Um, we still haven't actually decided where we're going next, so I don't know how long we'll be out of the water. As soon as I leave the control room, we'll go figure that out. Um, but it will likely be... Actually, I don't know. I'm not going to say what it'll likely be. I don't know. What <laughs> I don't know what we're thinking yet. <laughs> so stand by for updates. <laughs> so keep tuning in to NautilusLive.com, and we'll keep the status uh, up to date. And hello, Sam's class. Glad to see you're tuning in. Um, Brian, do you have like a place that you just absolutely want to dive? Scuba ROV. Uh, ROV, like somewhere here on this feature. Or I'm sorry, somewhere here in this expedition. No, I don't have a single spot that I'm like dying to. I, I want to, one of my goals for this week as we wrap up is we still haven't gotten down to 3,000 meters. Um, which is generally sparser on the coral standpoint, but mm -hmm. um, but very little work has been done anywhere near here at that depth. And so probably almost everything we see down there will be new. Um, and so I, I do want to go down to 3,000 meters at some point soonish um, to try and get just some data in the deeper reaches. Um, but I don't have a single specific place I'm dying to dive. Because and that's kind of thing. Honestly, like the three thousand meter dive is probably not going to be that exciting from. Do you want to try for a rock somewhere in here? Ecology standpoint, mm -hmm. but it will. Um, but it will yeah, be the taxonomist will really probably appreciate the samples uh, and from understanding what that lives in this area. I highly doubt anything is going to be. Yeah, everything looks uh, really yeah, everything's solid. Really solid. <laughs> Perhaps something in this little crevice somewhere, oop, somewhere over there. I just can't really tell. We're oh down I'm below here, like center bottom. Like that, maybe. Could have it. I don't Come know. Down five, please. definitely a maybe it's more it seems more likely that we could get this one than any other one but I don't know good as places I need to do housekeeping sediment. Oh, dang it. How about that one straight back? I don't know if you're going to reach that far. To your right. Hmm? That one? Yeah. Right more? Oh, that, that one. one. No. <laughs> Shoot. Bang. No rocks want to come home. 
Yeah, let's try this one. Oh. So, no. If I break this arm, Ren has to fix it. <laughs> Ren might enjoy that, don't tempt him. <laughs> Oh. Uh, oh, crumbly. That's <laughs> oh, a lot of crust. A little piece in there. I don't know if that counts. No, I don't think so, but uh, can you take a zoom on it so we can see the yeah. thickness of the crust since it's gotten knocked off? Zoom in there. Yeah, that's some thick crust. Wow. Yeah. Very oxidized, too. Mm -hmm. You got and what you need. white line is secondary mineralization. Um, it's phosphate. I didn't hear say. So. Oh, just the white part, that white thing in there is secondary mineralization. So the crust forms, and then after time, you start to incorporate phosphate minerals into the crust. Ooh. Well, I think science is good for the dive. Thank all you all, right, front row, for a good dive. Yay. Okay, go wind down. Let's see if we can stash our bone here. Coralie, have you seen any rocks that you're just like, after you brought them up to the surface, have just been absolutely surprising to you? Or any big revelations? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. I haven't really been looking at the rocks. Um, but there are two of them here or just one? There's two. Um, Adam has been looking more at the rocks. He's looking more at the inside of the manganese crust portion. That's cool. I didn't know these little bungee type things were on here. It's so neat. Oh, ditter. What's that? Oh, yeah. Sure. Nothing's going to come flying out, is it? Yeah, you'll have to come all the way up. Kiwi sponge. 
our urchin is climbing up the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Is that white thing a part of the bone? Yeah. Okay. And those other two are bones as well. That's or so fossils. cool. Maybe fossils. Found a lot of stuff, didn't they? Yeah. Chris, what are you more interested to see? The possible whale fossils or the bone fall with the bone worms on it? Well, we already got a couple of fossils, whale fossils, so yeah. I'm pretty excited to see the skeleton, see what it is. Yeah. track the porch and see what happens. I have to I'll kind of slide underneath there. I'll give a bump. Give a bump. Yeah, another bump. One more. Right there, yeah. They're kind of captured under the uh, back there. You don't think so? Well, they're under the bungee, so. I'd say they're captured. Well, we could just watch them on the way up, right? Up some up. Benny. I believe you want to spin counterclock to take out my half turn. Yeah, we're going to go tail to tail, yeah. That's the wrong way. You gotta go around the other way. I can never work that out, I just gotta try it. Needs a little arrow. Go this way.
Thank you for uh, your kind words from our Oregon fan base. They said that they have enjoyed watching and listening to our conversations. Uh, no. Okay, start coming up. Who do I know in Oregon? Dan, you seem to have fans everywhere you go, so... I, I live in Oregon, so... Oh. <laughs> hey, guys and girls. That's a WAP. We're coming home. Well, I'm not coming home, but the <laughs> ROV is. When am I coming home? I don't know. June? July? Are you on for the expedition after this one? Or do you get a break? Yeah, I'm on through ONC. Ooh, that is... That's a long stint. That's like three months. Yeah. Bless your soul. Left home in uh, April. Do you get any breaks like a like oh I get to go home for a week? No, I could have gone home for a week between uh, this job at ONC, but it's, uh, going home for nine days is you barely get home, and then it would be time to come right back. I hate traveling, so. Easier just to ride the boat. <laughs> Shorter flight home. I feel like the older I get, the less I enjoy traveling on airplanes. Um, I don't mind the airplanes getting on and off the thing. It's painful. Gotcha. That's one of the things um, I enjoy being, like I leave from Corpus Christi Airport and that's a small regional and it's, oh, it's so much easier than going through like Houston or Seattle or one of the big boys. Okay, I'm making 18. One hundred minutes at that speed. Hope I don't have to drop a weight. If we can get it going here and make twenty. If you come up to twenty, it might help. Can go to twenty win. That they're working on the chiller. So it must be the lower chiller having an issue. The one the data the lab below us. It's not this room yet. So if that room's getting warm, this room will get warm pretty quickly. As we are sending up for those online, you might see uh, the manipulator arm is on top of two what looks like charred remains. Those are the potential potential two fossils that were collected earlier, potentially two more whale fossils. Um, also inside one of the boxes is some kind of bone. We're not sure what. 
And so we look forward to analyzing that. If you go back in your YouTube dive footage, you'll be able to look about four and a half hours ago and eight hours ago uh, to see us collecting those samples. Chris, I have a question about Palmyra. Um, since you're out there so much and you do see whales from time to time, have you ever seen any whale bones that have washed up on shore? Um, there's, on one of the islands, there is a full uh, dolphin skeleton that is on, like, on, like, laid out on one of the islands. You can see it, it's pretty much in the same form. You wow. can see the rostrum and the vertebrae and the flippers and all that. How many, I thought it was just uh, Kingman was the only other little island piece of land out there oh palmyra consists of about 36 islands like 36 little islands that make up the atoll oh okay okay and so it's one of the one of the outside islands as the dolphin, as the dolphin. On it. do y'all guys get to explore uh, the different islands a whole bunch like kayaking or in a small boat uh we're allowed to go kayaking and paddle boarding around pretty much wherever we want but we're not allowed to go on land outside of Cooper and Barron Island, which are the two that TNC owns. Mm. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife manages the rest of them, and uh, you're not allowed to go on there without special permission or uh, guide, or oh. have, you have to have a purpose for going out there. And you have to have a special quarantine clothing and all really? that so you don't contaminate or bring okay. other biocontaminants over there. So have you seen, have you been able to go onto those islands using the special permits and the special clothing? Yeah, I've gotten to help out with a few projects. The Cocos, like Lynette did, they went out there to do some rainforest realignment, which basically is hacking down coconut sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've gotten to help out with them with that. And some of the bird monitoring projects I've gotten to go out with and uh, other terrestrial monitoring projects. So I go out as often as I can. Yeah. So there's a lot of bird monitoring, you said, and all the subsequent islands. Yeah, right. So there's mostly um, the boobies and the frigate birds and the tropic birds all use, some of them use more parts of the refuge than others, but they're all over the place. There's tons of them. And is it a primary nesting spot or is it just where they like to land and hang out? Yeah, it's a, definitely a primary nesting spot. It's got the largest, the second largest nesting colony of red-footed boobies. What's the first largest? Uh, the Galapagos Islands. Oh, I will be going there in a couple of months. Oh, cool. I'm super yeah. jealous. That sounds awesome. I'm, I'm kind of stunned that I got it, but I'm like, yay. Uh, yeah, so thank you National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions for funding me to go to the Galapagos. Oh, that's great. That would be an awesome experience. I've always wanted to go there. Yeah, it sounds really, really interesting. Like a good mix of paddle boarding, uh, snorkeling, diving, nature trail in it, bird watching. Like just this beautiful mix of everything. Cool. Kind of what it sounds like for Palmyra. Just yeah. this beautiful mix <laughs> of everything with work, you know, kind of just there. Uh, but right, yeah. Do your eight hours and then free time. Um, they also have the blue footed boobies out on the glass. What did the previous watch find? Uh, not the previous watch, but the one before the one, found uh, a whale or fish fall oh. being actively um, broken down by ostex worms. What? <laughs> That's cool. That's so cool.
Holy moly. This hard pictures? Samantha, did you have a question? Uh, nope. Since been resolved. Thank you. It was actually Robert's question. Okay. But thanks for checking in on us. Yep. Do you have any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Oh. Yes, Not I you. Do. <laughs> <laughs> so no. glad, so glad you asked. Uh, See what first you got. of all, <laughs> on the color wheel, uh, what's the opposite of yellow? Purple. Hmm. The opposite of yellow. Is opposite of yellow. Magenta. <laughs> oh. See, I knew this would create some debate. <laughs> it's too early. No. Magenta's not the Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Who knows for sure? No one. No one, <laughs> one knows for sure. <laughs> not even Google. Google. Great mystery, Google 2023. <laughs> uh, Spencer, oh. which color wheel? Oh, oh, oh knows okay. Uh, he knows his color wheels. Additive. Greenwich mean color wheel. Additive <laughs> colors, subtractive colors. Oh. Uh, okay. What is, what's the difference? Oh, well, additive <laughs> plus and minus. Thank you. <laughs> additive colors are like light, where you combine different colors of light together, like red, green, and blue make white. Uh -huh. Subtractive colors are like paint, where it absorbs different wavelengths of light. So the combinations are different on the color wheel. Awesome. That's your science fact for this morning. Yeah, Dave, <laughs> Dave yeah. thanks for tuning in. Dave Dropping gives knowledge. me a cue card before each thing. He's like, all right, ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next question is, what's that bucket by the winch hanging hanging from above? I would say it's a condensation collection bucket. <laughs> is that a steam, You'd be steam you carrier? Uh, <laughs> so wherever you see those trays, those metal trays, mm -hmm. those are a condensation tray mm -hmm. and since the ship tilts oh. opposite from where the drains are the water comes pouring over the side of those and gets all over everything i see like almost on my laptop oh. <laughs> why is your laptop in the windshield my laptop's sitting on my nice table down in my nice cabin and the vent oh. above it is raining down well, the water's running across one of the roof panels and then dripping through. Oh. Just <coughs> inches away. <laughs> so I was on the Kiel Moana in the lab there and had my laptop open. I left it open overnight, and one of the air vents was getting regular, like, sea coming into the oh. vent. And so there's a little bit of salt water in the vent and it eventually corroded away enough to open a hole right above my laptop no and it came way. in and it was filled up to the top of the keyboard <laughs> with oh, no. seawater oh, no. <laughs> but the university of hawaii bought me a new laptop hey that's nice they they did not want to but <laughs> <laughs> i mean does anybody ever really like want they, to? they told me it was my fault for leaving my laptop in the lab <laughs> wow. <laughs> Why would you leave it in the workspace? Yeah. The <laughs> yeah, what a dumb thing to do. <laughs> Everyone knows you store it under the table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any questions? What about chat? Um, they all checked out because we're... <laughs> <laughs> No, chat is wondering, did, well, first question, did the male buoy deliver you more cabbage? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. 
that would be a bad pickup run. We yeah, but I I know I said I was joking, damage. Paula, but I'm not joking. There is a male buoy, and we're gonna be no. There. no. You're not getting me this. No. <laughs> no. And I know we're um. I have some viewers wondering, we have some viewers wondering about the camera, if we can see in the midwater, if, if that's possible. Uh, uh, rather than staring at the bones, is that, is that what you want? I guess so. We'll ignore the bones. Well, we still have them on the pilot cam. You have uh, Atalanta. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, chat. That wasn't a casual chat. That was a request science. accepted. <laughs> sure, chat. Uh, <laughs> oh, and Can then we this see is some midwater. <laughs> this is a, a question for Robert. Following your ham radio story, will we ever get to listen to a Bob and Dad podcast over the sea waves? Ham radio story. Yeah. Oh, a ham radio operator. Oh. Certified. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an amateur extra. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big deal. <laughs> is that an official? Yeah, title? it is. Yeah, that's the highest rating for uh, a license, a ham radio license. I thought when you gave your call last night that that was an extra call. I was going to ask you about it. Yeah, then we got it's busy. amateur extra. Wow. Uh, I also have a third class radio telephone. I never got a first class, but I used to work at a radio station. What's oh, that mean? Oh, wow. What's a third class radio telephone? I'm looking that's it up. That's the lowest class of, of, of oh, uh, broadcast yeah, license. I have a first. Yeah. Wow. Yep. That and five bucks will get you coffee yeah. at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the five bucks. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Amateur Extra is the highest title. Yeah. That well, I don't have Morse code. To, I don't have Morse code, though. They need, need to. to yeah, a little rebranding. <laughs> I don't have like, Morse code stuff. Like I never bothered. Maximum potentate or something. You know, <laughs> sounds a little better. Well, there's only three. What's below amateur extra? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> Technician? Yeah. And then general? That, yeah. Right? That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Double plus. Good. They don't do novice anymore? No. Because anybody, so. anybody can get a ticket now. Yeah. When I got my ham license, I had to do Morse code and... Got my amateur ticket. Yeah, and all yeah. Of that. They used to make you oh, be cool. proficient at Morse code. Oh yeah, oh, five wow. words a minute to get your amateur or to get your uh, novice ticket. Wow. Do, 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 I got mine when I was 14. Wow. <sighs> no one speaks in Morse uh, anymore. I just bumped it up. Uh, you were uh, almost at 20 below me. But what was the original question? A mom and pop radio show? What? Dan, Dan and Robert. Yeah, will we ever get to listen a Bob to a Bob and Dan podcast over the sea waves? Oh, a Bob and Dan podcast. Wow. That'd be something. <laughs> nope. We get that podcast when they talk to each other on the radio on the ship. <laughs> we talk nerd. <laughs> Oh, and our word of the day, the yips. <laughs> yips. Yeah, yips. that's not a very good one. Yips. That was the actual you got the yips? Y-I-P-S. Yeah, yep. Didn't they say, yeah, you got the yips is only, like, that's a, the only way you would hear yips, right? It's a golf term. Oh, it's no. a baseball term. I thought it was a dog term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dogs yip. Or fox. Right. fox <laughs> yeah, in baseball it means it. you you've kind of gotten so far into your head you can't like throw from oh, shortstop to first base. Yeah, in golf it means you've lost your like you can't putt anymore that kind of thing. Uh. You're too psyched ah. out. In ocean exploration it means you can't winch up anymore. You just <laughs> forgot how to do it. <laughs> Maybe Herc is under at Atlanta on ascent. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't look at me. Your your co pilot notified you already. We're good. He notified We're me. Solid. I notified him, I'll have you know. And then he said that he was tailing it. I told you when you guys fight like this, I really it makes me uncomfortable. Dad's gonna come up there. Uh, 
All right, were you there yet? Nope. 1,000 meters. Well, 1,100. Yeah, what is the corrective action for that situation? What? The current situation? Hold, hold winch, let her come up more? What? 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 Uh -huh. what? <laughs> Who's ahead of who? Currently right now. Currently, Atalanta's ahead of Herc. Oh, sorry, Herc is ahead of Atalanta. Ah. Yeah. yeah. What's the corrective action in such instance? Turn oh. on your laterals. And <laughs> to tell, the, Atalanta. To tell yeah. the Atalanta pilot to get the thing moving. Get the thing moving. <laughs> We're moving. We're moving. Not long ago, it was the opposite way around. <laughs> and then, he, then Robert gave it the beans. The bean. Corrective bean action. Corrective bean action. That's a uh, motion passed by the SMA. <laughs> Ship Association of America. Yeah. Issues corrective bean actions when you're out of line within the association. <laughs> <laughs> well, Samantha wants to come out as an Atalanta person. Yeah, do it. On the job training. When are you going to sail as captain? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not anytime soon. Getting up there in sea days, though. I could apply for a license. Well, I think it takes more than just being on a boat. You have well, to I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez Louise. Okay. I'm like cruise ship people like applying for their mariner's certificate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Well, it looks like maybe the chiller is off now. Yeah. Ooh. Well, it emitted smoke and Hex. had engineers running into the room, so I think that was a indicator. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was uh, talking to somebody else. Forgot I was on SPL, but uh, yeah, it was. they're working on it. Do we have concerns? Dave, about you want me to uh, slow down for you? Um, yes, but I'm waiting to hear yeah. more. Right now, yeah. van temperature's okay. I'm trying okay. to maintain position here, but maybe I'll abandon it. We're not abandoning either ROV, please. <laughs> we had this discussion last night. <laughs> Ooh, there's a, a snot sack or whatever you call it. Lorvation? Mucus yeah. house? Yeah. A snot Aww. shack? <laughs> snot, snot, sack. snot house, please. Oh. Have some respect. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Larvations are these incredible little chordates, little animals that have um, create mucus houses to be able to filter food out of the water as they drift in the midwater. Oh, wow. And they're um, a study from Mimbari that came out a couple years ago showed that like there was some insane percentage of marine snow that was made out of larvation houses. So they're also a huge um, source of food for benthic deep sea animals, which is incredible. Mm. I'm gonna look up that paper. Get some numbers for this group. Pine beans. All right, I got a question for the front row. What makes a traction winch different from a normal winch? Hello. So <coughs> we used to have a direct drive winch where all the tension on the wires goes right on the drum. And that's harder on the wire. 
it takes a lot of power, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but this is the one we have is a traction winch, and it has a, like a block and tackle sort of arrangement that that does the that handles the tension of the wire. Mm -hmm. And then the drum is just it just has uh, only has two thousand pounds of pressure on it just to wind the wire up. So that big uh, wheel before the yeah, before there's, there's two there's two wheels. You can see it. It goes around it four times. Or yeah, yeah, five right, times. Right. Yeah, we're sending that out on Sat three right now. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's a block and tackle sort of thing. So the drum's not seeing all the weight of the wire. Otherwise, if we get those. Uh the spikes of 10,000 pounds that would be directed directly to the storage drum uh, and not taken up by the traction winch portion of it. Yeah. So it's much tougher on the wire. How does the force, is it because it goes around that first drum a number of times? Yeah. And, and then <coughs> the speed that, that it gets pulled from that drum is what makes it uh, so that how do you reduce the force what's what's the it, yeah the the force is in the block and tackle gear it's not the drum the drums just it just maintains a steady uh, right. up to 2,000 pounds mm -hmm. so it just takes up any slack you know right So the actual force is in the in the mechanism driving the block and tackle part of it. You say block and tackle, but I'm not. That, it, I'm when you get like football terms. Oh no, no. When you when you have multiple pulleys, yeah. and the line goes. So the force is every time you go around like that, you half the force. Uh, right. It's a mechanical advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can provide a little update for folks on SBL. Uh, we're having an uh, issue with our chiller system on board, which uh, provides support for the air conditioning. So we're going to need to start um, powering down some of our non-operation uh, essential computers, which unfortunately means an end to our SPL and chat for this morning. Do you want to drive a little bit further out? Try and get a heading. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we'll wait to, for someone to tell us what to turn off. Can we stream ahead then? You want to start streaming ahead now? Yeah. Sure. In case we have to go in that mode. I'm, I'm having yeah. trouble keeping the cable stretched out. Okay. And having to drive, so. Yeah. It'd just be easier. Okay. We're not trying to stay over a position anyway. No. Do you want to do 0 0.3? Yeah. Okay. Bridge now. Uh, we don't have it up right now. Sorry. It was like 40 minutes. Good morning. Um, could we start streaming forward at 0 0.3 knots to uh, help us get the ROVs in line? Yep, thank you. Still looking at a 9 o'clock on service. Bring it 
up fast and get. Yeah, we want actually we want we want Atlanta to lead the operation so that I, rather than me trying to pull Atlanta down, you're pulling me up. We'll we'll shorten the time a bit. Yeah, you wanna. Streaming forward, 0 0.3 is coming up. I would dump weights, but we're currently using the uh, manipulator. Yep. <laughs> I'm assuming the magnum arm doesn't have that level of uh well by the time it moves over there the dive will be over. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Not magnum arm. <laughs> yep. Let's now. do it. Let's do it. Oh, it looks kind of zippy today. It's been uh, turbocharged. Dang. Uh, we have a uh, on service recovery time of uh, zero 0900. Uh, no, we can continue streaming forward. Yeah, just like you know, an updated time. And then if you want to uh, secure tanks and the aft deck fan and enable air to tuggers um, in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Kind of looks like a turtle head. It does look like a turtle head. <laughs> or dinosaur. He looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> so you are using it. Oh. Uh, well, so much for that. Is that his, is that all you got for reach? The shoulders doesn't go down. Oh. Uh, uh, I'm going <laughs> home. I'm impressed with the speed, though. It's pretty zippy. happy streaming forward still? Yeah. You want to just do that until we recover? Yeah. Okay. How are we doing with the temperature? Uh, um, 
based on Dave's currently movements, up. I think we are still going up. <laughs> okay. Currently up to 20.2. Yeah, going up faster now. 35 minutes. Perfect. And the, okay. You can leave that one on. This one, okay. This one, too.
Uh, Samantha? Yes, Paula. Oh yeah, do we have an update? Do you want me to write something on the sea log about the temperature situation? Uh, sure. Noted, thank you. <laughs> 